Hey, Objectivity, Michael here from Vsauce. Brady is not here, but I've got the white gloves and I've got Keith. So, Keith? We're good to go. Oh, let me suit up. Do, do, by all means. Okay. Now, did Brady tell you anything about me? Well, he said that you were tremendously interested in optical illusions. Yes, so, that is true. Uh, therefore, uh, in, a, in a house full of portraits, as our society is, we, we thought we'd talk about that great optical illusion. Uh, why do portraits' eyes seem to follow you around? What's going on there? And in fact, there was a paper written for the Royal Society in 1824 on just this topic, and here it is. This is it. Mm. So who wrote this and when? So this is William Hyde Wollaston, whom you might know better as a chemist. He discovered several new elements with his great friends, Smithson Tennant. He would eventually become president of the Royal Society, so a very eminent scientist indeed. And he's one of that generation of great romantic chemists, including Humphrey Davy, who discovered uh, masses of, of, of new elements. So this is the new chemistry in the romantic period. Yeah, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out, speaking of Humphrey Davy, Look who's behind us. Indeed, looking very uh, Regency dandy. There's Humphrey Davy in the 1820s as president of the Royal Society with his minor safety lamp on the table next to him. William Hyde Wollaston wrote this paper when he wasn't discovering elements titled mm. On the Apparent Direction of Eyes in a Portrait. Did he figure it out? Not really. He, he, he did a lot of work on uh, how uh, you perceive the direction of eyes, but he didn't really figure out uh, uh, why portrait eyes seem to follow you around the room. What he did do was employ one of his friends to help him work this out, though. Okay. And uh, he just happened to have uh, the most famous portrait painter of the Regency on his side. So. Davy there is painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence. And who does Wollaston get but Sir Thomas Lawrence to do the illustrations? What for a his coincidence. Paper. I yeah. feel like you picked this spot to film for a reason. Yeah. Kind of reading through it, I get the sense that he doesn't answer the question of the title. That's right, yes. Yeah. So he rolls around the subject a little bit but he, he doesn't really get to, to the nub of the issue. However, uh, the illustrations here make up for all of that. So oh, the, very cool. the, the great scientist really doesn't do the business, but the great artist, Sir Thomas Lawrence, does. So maybe we should have a look Let's at Let's take these. a look, yeah. yeah. Sure. So in its original wrappers, here are Sir Thomas Lawrence's. Okay, so this first one is a uh, portrait of a woman, and there's a slot cut for her eyes. So the eyes are exactly the same for her as they are for, I'm assuming, the person below. Now let's open this up and, oh, She now, seems to be looking at you now. Quite coquettishly, yeah. if I may say so. So we're going from looking right at the viewer to almost looking forlorn and sad, but up. Have a look at uh, some of these okay. others here. Yeah. This is a guy looking right at us, looking right into the camera, looking right at me, but uh, I'm gonna change everything below the eyes. And now, because of the orientation of the face, my brain is interpreting his gaze to be slightly away from center now. Whereas with this face, he's looking straight ahead. That is really cool. And, and these are beautiful pictures. These aren't little stick figure drawings. That's right. These yes. are drawn by a preeminent English artist. So this woman is looking, I would say, out kind of uh, to, to her left. But, oh, this one folds down twice. Yes. This is a triple illusion. What will the final gaze be? Oh, <laughs> sad. Like, it doesn't need to be sad. I don't know why she it, had it to be so... It doesn't, but it, somehow it works. Yeah, and she's now looking sort of up. But these eyes are the same eyes for every person. Wow. So they're lovely. And of course, the illustrations in the scientific journal wouldn't have been like this. It'd be quite flat. But as Wollaston's paper was read before the fellows at a meeting, they would have passed these round, presumably, and just played with them as a, as a, a, a scientific toy almost. And now we've got a gentleman here who is looking, I would say, slightly to uh, his left and now slightly to his right. Just by changing his posture, the way his face is uh, oriented. It's amazing how dramatic the difference is. This one is, is quite like William Hyde Wallace, and I do wonder if, if Lawrence sketched him as part of the paper as a kind of an in-joke. Oh, it, wow. it would be nice if he had. Yeah, and also, speaking of Lawrence, 
Wollaston writes this little paper, which is a bit like a Vsauce episode, for those of you who are familiar with my channel, doesn't really answer the question, goes into a lot of detail about a lot of things, but yet, unlike me, who kind of does some of my own animations, he gets a super famous artist to draw yeah. his illustrations. And these are beautiful. And, I mean, they're almost cooler than the paper, really. I think they are. Yeah. What you are looking at here is one of the most magnificent artifacts of all science. What we're looking at here is the invention of scientific publishing. That was carried out by the Royal Society in 1665, just five years after its foundation. And what it essentially did is opened up constructive discourse into science.